one of the reasons I like to share these with you is this is sort of this is sort of a loose adaptation of some stories that I know about where people were looking at vehicles, and these are professional guys. I'm gonna take this off today. Professional guys that had uh, issues they had to deal with, and they were asking for help. So we're gonna see what they come up here with. On this one here, we had an Acura MDX with a 2.5 in it. And a shop had pulled the heads for a valve job and it had a misfire uh, codes on every cylinder except cylinder number one. And this is a Honda, uh, I mean, excuse me, Acura, which is like a Honda, you know, MDX 3.5. Okay, the misfires are only present at an idle. When you start the engine, it sounds like the valve may be out of time. In other words, you can, uh, when you started over, apparently it sounded like you got eyeball compression, you know, different from cylinder to cylinder, just listening to it. Cam and crank correlation test seemed to match the known good waveform, and the compression was checked and was inspected. He didn't really re catch any compression issues. Now, he didn't do a running compression test either, but whenever he compared the waveform to a known good one, he basically had that. So this is a number one call. That's TDC sensor two, TDC sensor one, and then your crank sensor down there on the bottom. All right, and so he actually went ahead and did your in-cylinder testing with the engine running and the transducer in there, uh, you might remember how we looked, talked about this a few weeks ago. This is your, uh, basically your compression, and then after your compression stroke, and it goes down in there, which would have been your power stroke if there was a spark plug in there, but you can actually get a spark plug that will fire uh, while you're checking this. You've got to have a special spark plug to let you go in there with your pressure. It's, you, know, you can get that if you want to, if you want to go uh, play the, the exhaust valve. You've got this little bucket here, and then your exhaust valve opens, and it's pushing exhaust out. Then the exhaust valve closes, and you got intake, basically it's supposed to go down here, and then it goes back to compression again. So basically this is just one of the cylinders. This isn't a bunch of the cylinders. Uh, so the only cylinder that shows the valves open and closing okay is cylinder number one. That's what this guy's notion because he hadn't done a lot of these tests. Uh, and the waveforms from the other cylinders didn't look like they should have him. See that? That's what they look like him. You might notice he's got the same time stamp, the same uh, pressure division, 10 PSI per division, which would be, you know, 10, 20, 30, so on and so forth. And that's what he's got his, and he's looking at that one. That's cylinder number three. This is cylinder number four. Uh, basically had it on there. See how they look slightly different? I mean, they don't look the same. That one there doesn't have the disturbances in there. Here's your little, uh, whatever it has gone down from the power stroke right before the uh, exhaust valve opens. You get that little bit of low pressure and then it comes up and then it, when the exhaust valve closed, you get low pressure again. It starts to draw the, all this time it's drawing air in because the pressure is low, and then it squeezes it again, and so on and so forth. All right, so here's cylinder number six, and it looks a little different from the other one, all that. And so, what do you think might be wrong with this guy's, uh, this guy's problem so far? Sounds like they didn't do the valve valve right. Yeah. And it wasn't doing that before it came in. Part, well, partially. I mean, you're, you're really close. You're really, really close. Uh, I feel like this right here. Now this one, here's a guy that a comment that was made. Uh, uh, this came in on a, one of the Facebook pages that I'm a. It's a closed group that I'm a part of, you know. Uh, but it, it is a Facebook thing. Hard to tell if the time is an issue from cylinder pressure picks, but I can tell that there's definitely a valve sealing issue. All right now, this right here is the, the cylinder number one, and these are these little pockets he's talking about. The pocket of the exhaust is well below the intake pocket. See there? There's your exhaust pocket. And there's your intake pocket. This can be caused by valve, by timing or a valve sealing problem. If you have an overlay for timing and also add vacuum waveform, that would tell a whole lot more. So if you had a vacuum waveform, in addition to this, you'd be able to tell more about it. So misfires at cold startup or a constant misfire may require a valve adjustment. Now Hondas still have valve adjustments. I mean, even the later model ones and all. Uh, this guy says I ran into this, same comments two and three, ran into the same issue, Honda Van 3.5. Misfired idle when cold, but would stop skipping when warm. Adjust valve lash to Honda Alexis spec, and all the skipping and misfire should go away. And this guy here says, uh, if you did a compression test with an amp probe, you'd see inconsistency with an easy hump valve adjustment. He's talking about valve adjustment too. The exhaust pocket is too deep compared to the intake pocket. Keep it simple and look back. Map sensor fuel trim. What do you see? Uh, the intake valves tend to loosen over time. The exhaust valves tighten. The ones that are tight are the ones that's going to be causing it not to seal good. You know, have they're going to be partially open. If the intake valves are loose, it'll sound quieter after the valves are adjusted. A valve that's too tight will eventually it'll eventually burn the valve because there'll be fire going by that seat. Right? 
and this is basically on those Hondas, you know, you loosen that nut and turn that down until you're, but you've got to have that valve open, and there's a particular order you do this in, if you know what the firing order is, and you know which cylinders to go to, you know, if you've done a couple of them, it's not that big of a deal, and uh, they actually have go-no-go -no -go gauges that are thin, and then they get thicker, so you'll have it like 10 and 20, and if you want it to, you know, it slides in and then stops when you hit 20, it'll be like a stepped feeler gauge for that. Uh, set the number one piston at TDC, you start out there, and then on a V6, if you know what the firing order is, and typically on most V6s it's one, two, three, four, five, six, where the cylinder's number staggered, you just gotta know where number one is. But if you turn it 120 degrees, you're at the next cylinder's firing order, and you can adjust the ones on that cylinder. Now some people will be a smart aleck and they'll say, you can adjust the intake of the exhaust on this one and that one and the other one. I kind of like, to, I'm more of a sequential OD, you know, OCD kind of a guy like that. I like to adjust them, you know, as the cylinder with both of them you know, good and closed, and the, see where the cam lobe is? The cam lobe is down so that you've got the maximum amount of lash. If you do your adjustment when the cam lobe is part of the way up, you're obviously not going to set it right, so don't go there. All right. Now, with the feeler gauge between the adjusted screw and the end of the valve stem right there, you should feel a slight amount of drag. And here's your specs. Intake is 8 to 9 thousandths of an inch, exhaust is 11 to 13. So they want the exhaust to be a little bit looser so that it'll have more time before it needs its next adjustment. All right, here's another one. Altima 3.5 3 V6 no start. It was driven into the shop with a rattling timing chain. Originally, customer bought their own used engine from someplace on the line, and a shop installed it, but then found out they didn't have any injector pulse, and then it wound up with this guy giving them a hand. If you spray the intake with carburetor cleaner, the engine will start. So what's that telling you? What does it mean if you spray it, if, you, if it starts and dies, or if you spray it with carburetor cleaner and it starts, what do you know? You're getting spark. You know that you're getting spark. You know that the engine is mechanically in time, typically. Uh, but you just what you're missing is fuel. Uh, no codes. No problem with the anti-theft system. Now, the anti-theft system can disable the fuel injection, and usually it does. Uh, on some of them, it'll disable spark and fuel injection, but that's rare. I've seen that one time, even though a guy that was an expert told me it wouldn't happen. But I have seen it. On all other data on the scanner looks fine. Double check powers, ground sense engine was replaced. He says, guys, I'm suspicious of engine timing since this is a used engine. Now, he decided to check the cam and crank signals. The cam on the rear of the engine lined up perfectly with the crank signal that's posted. The front cam showed it to be out of time. This is the way it's supposed to look. Now, this particular graphic here I got out of the shop manual in that particular part. Sometimes the shop manual has, has Patterns you can go by, and sometimes it doesn't. I will tell you this: I had one one time, and the, it looked like it, it wasn't lined <laughs> up right with what the factory had posted and all that stuff. And um, seems to me like I got it from a Denafix or something. But anyway, I fought with that thing and fought with it, and I checked it. It wasn't out of time or anything, but I would have sworn it was out of time. Uh, looking at it on my scope, and it turned out that it was cutting up because the. Uh, wire was broke back there on the crane. It was on a PT Cruiser. I talked about that here a while back. Anyway, well this vehicle, rear cam always lines up as it should. The front cam never does. And so basically there's your bank one and two. See how they are? Now they're supposed to line up uh, cam bank one. So you got long space in between there and, and see where your spaces are. They always line up on them missing two things if they're like they're supposed to be. He was thinking because he did that scope pattern, he had something like that. Now, sometimes you'll get thrown by a scope that's giving you a, a pattern. The PCM was bad. Scope pattern count time and trace notwithstanding. See, uh, before pulling the engine apart, uh, they got to get went to the bone yard and they got a used PCM to see what would happen. They didn't happen to be able to find one. And they got it fired up. It was not a problem after that. Now, uh, he did say that he was wanting to check it again to see what the cam looked like after the oil pressure came up. but. They didn't want to take the time to do that. They wanted to you know, sew it up and give that customer. Uh, I've seen Hall Effect cam sensor trace, this is my note right here, on an Altima that was out of line. And I knew good and doggone well the engine wasn't out of time. But that would have been checked and double checked. But it was showing out of time. And all I did was call up there and say, send me another cam sensor. And when I put it on there, it was lined up and it fired up and everything was fine. On, a, on an Altima, though, if the cam sensor is not giving you the right signal, if you've got a cam sensor that's out of, I mean, is disconnected or not working right, it may start and it may not. So you've got to be aware of that. That's only on the Altima, though, you know. And it'll start hard if it's a V6 
Nissan with one bad cam sensor. I've seen that too. It'll start hard. And they'll go, yeah, it's been a long time. And so if you're getting a cam sensor code and you got a hard start or sometimes no start, think about the cam sensor. Uh, this guy said we got a media got injected pulse that wouldn't start. That's when he took a PCM on there. Excuse me, I got that one crossed up with another one. And then bad fuel pump relay and put that on there and fired it up. So they took a fuel pump relay and a PCM to make it happen. See, so they got pulse, but they didn't have any pressure on that. Uh, he said his scanner data showed the cam time was equal on both sides after they got it started up, but he figured maybe went to all pressure tensioners kick in and tighten the time and change up and running up the guy. Straightened up. All right, this is a 2008 Dodge Grand Caravan, and uh, came in for a mill, retrieved the 301 code, replaced the plugs and wires, test drove it, everything seemed it was fine, started up cold the next day, and cylinder one was missing again for a few seconds, and then it cleared up. So, does it almost every time cold, it never went warmed up. Swap plugs and injectors with no change, plenum gaskets are good with no leaks, is what he was saying initially. Okay, so remember, he's cranking it up, it skips a little bit, and then it cleans up its act. And the only time it ever does it was when it's cold. Now, back in the days, whenever some of the wind stars were out in the late 90s, there were cylinder head gaskets that were letting water seep into the combustion chamber and it would wet the spark plug. You crank it up, and the spark plug wouldn't fire until it, until it dried off and started popping. And when I do that, I like to crank it up while it's skipping, shut it off, pull the plugs out. If I see one steaming, I know I got issues with cooling getting in there. Uh, that's what I was talking about right here. Remove the plug in the question and see if the skipper is wet with coolant or fuel. Uh, if it's a coolant or head gasket or intake gasket suspect, if it's fuel and injector suspect, and this guy right here, that's the way the cylinder will end up on that one, one, three, five, two, four, six. And uh, you know, here's us put this toward the front. And he's basically, you know, there's these coolant passages that are going through the end, front of the intake and back of it. And it's possible for the intake to get pulled out in there and suck oil in there. It can also leak coolant through there. And those silly uh, plastic and silicone intake gaskets nowadays left to go sour and everybody's using them, or a lot of people are. Uh, and whenever they crack and they let coolant bypass in there, there's a leaking gasket, that coolant seep into number one apparently. Now here's a 2011 Jeep Grand Cherokee Laredo 3.6 liter. I'm having to go fast because we've got about 40 of these slides all together. Uh, new alternator was installed, fuse is tested good, battery voltage 12.4 at battery and alternator output terminal. How does that sound to you? This is with it running. That sounds a little weak to me. Uh, web search indicated totally integrated power module could cause a problem and he put a new one on there. Uh, that's the fuse box, you know, that's the smart fuse box on there. Uh, the alternator output remained at 12.4. Inspected a wire harness, no sign of any wiring concern. All right, see this right here is your generator fuel control. Comes right out of the powertrain control module. And basically you got your V plus there. Both of them are coming out of the powertrain control module, but used to the automatic shutdown relay would power up this and the generator fuel control. And Chrysler has been doing this since the mid 80s on some of them. <laughs> I mean, they were really went wacky about back in the mid 80s wanting the engine controller to be the voltage regulator. Nothing really wrong with that, it's usually pretty solid. And then your big V plus wire is basically going to be taking power back to the battery. Um, no matter what happened, you know, they had that right there. But the PCM was not for controlling the alternator fuel circuit replace and reprogram the PCM problem solved. In their particular case, there was nothing else it could be. PCM was obviously misreading the voltage that it was sensing in order to control the generator field, and so it wasn't giving it enough of a field. The more of a ground it delivered to the generator field, the more output you get, and it wasn't giving it enough. What you could do if you wanted to would be to compare it to a known good vehicle using a scope on this terminal right here. You'd see what the PCM was actually doing with that field. That's a good thing you can use a scope for. This is a 98 Honda CRV LX 2 liter extended crank. Whenever, after a hot soak, if they try to start it, they go, it took a long time to start. It'd sit for a few hours overnight and wouldn't start until you press the gas pedal. Okay, what does that sound like to you? Until you, this is fuel injection now, until you press the gas pedal, it wouldn't start. Not getting no gas. Just now, does the gas pedal, what gives it gas? I will tell you this though, if you're spinning it over and you're patting the gas, it is putting extra injector squirts in there. It is. It operates like, yeah, typically. But once it starts, it runs rough for about 10 to 15 seconds, then it runs fine. No smoke on startup, does not overheat. 
You're not going to believe what this guy did to fix this one. He used an AC Delco cooling system seal tabs. <laughs> Fuel pressure would decay about 10 PSI per hour with the engine off, but that wasn't enough pressure loss to cause this problem. So he already cleaned the throttle body. The left coolant fan was running slowly, monitored the coolant level, was using about 8 ounces every couple of days. He added 12 grams of stop leak. Each one of them, you know, is 4 grams. Uh, the problem was gone. He said he replaced the head gasket later that year. You know, this was his vehicle. Uh, 2000 uh, Toyota Avalon 3 liter came in for a mill light and air fuel sensor codes. We put a sensor on it. Both air fuel sensor heater circuit has power. Uh, checked the voltage on ECU pins, had battery voltage, you know. This is a wiring schematic uh, on a Nissan, what it looks like. These are heated oxygen sensors right here. See, they don't tell you what's inside of them, they just show up. Because they figure like you don't know that, you just need to know what wires are hooked to them and all that. Well, this is what's really cool, and I mean, I've seen this kind of thing before too myself. Uh, the previous shop put the head on the, and put the ground on the valve cover. These right here, look at this, location of the ground points and location of the connector adjoining the wire harness. If you learn how to read these, it's really cool. The ground points are the ones that look like an upside down triangle. And the connector joining the wire harness and wire harness is like that right there. And there'll be more than one of these usually because you got way, way a lot of connectors in there. But the point of the matter is, which one of these grounds was connected to the valve cover? He didn't say, uh, but you can look at it and see. Anytime you put a ground other somewhere other than where it's supposed to be, you're subject to cause yourself problems. I had worked on a Bronco 2 one time that was bucking and jumping, and one of the primary reasons it was doing that was because they put a ground wire that was supposed to be on the back of the cylinder head for oxygen sensor reference to the upper intake, which has got gaskets and all kinds of stuff in between there. And it wasn't, and I had a service bay diagnostic system hooked up to it. It wasn't until I moved that ground down there where it was supposed to be that that thing cleaned up its act and started doing right. Sensors can be unreliable if the PCM is grounded on the wrong part of the engine. And so a lot of times people say, well, the ground is a ground, I'll just put this bolt here. But when you're talking about sensors and computers, it needs to be grounded where the engineers decide to you know, put it. Uh, the head gaskets were replaced along with the timing belt spark plug. This is a legacy. The catalytic converter and the air fuel ratio sensor. The mill was on with a catalyst PO420. Uh, still storing the code after repairs. Fuel trim was normal and idle, but runs about minus 16 to minus 18 to <coughs> 3500. The car runs and drives very well. So he's got a catalyst code. What does a catalyst code basically mean? And which catalyst is being monitored by? Say that again. Uh, yeah, which catalyst? What do you. People. You're getting a PO420 code. Right. What does that mean? Load. It's yeah. a catalyst efficiency code, yeah. but how does it know the catalyst is not being efficient? The back oxygen That's right. It's why if they're both switching at the same rate, then it, it's going to say, well, the catalyst is not efficient. Now, if the catalyst is all you know, sooty and everything, it may be inefficient too. It's, it's basically measuring how it stores oxygen. Uh, and uh, he's talking about, you know, this back one back there. Think about that. The old trim at normal and idle, but runs about minus 16 or minus 18 at 3,500 RPM. All right, look at this. He installed the correct downstream Bosch air fuel ratio sensor. Now, don't ever fall into the trap of thinking that the downstream sensor won't affect fuel trim because that PCM is going to do everything it can to keep that catalytic converter happy. And so if the downstream oxygen sensor is reading wrong or it's not working right, you're going to see fuel trims go crazy. It took me a long time to learn that. But basically the downstream oxygen sensor, if the computer's watching it and says, my catalyst is unhappy, I've got to do whatever I can to make my catalyst happy. And so it can screw the fuel trims all up trying to make the catalyst happy, even though the front oxygen sensor may not indicate that any fuel trim corrections are needed. Mine's probably running late. Yeah, so anyway, he proved that thing off. It's the one behind the catalyst there. He put the right sensor on it. you got to realize occasionally you're going to run into issues where an aftermarket sensor, they may just, you know, do a one-size-fits-all thing and it may not work quite right, you know. So if you've got doubts and you're in trouble, you may have to put an OEM sensor on it, you know. Uh, 2003 Chevrolet Impala LS 3.8 sometimes idles very high. 3,000 RPM, clean throttle body passages, IEC, replaced TPS with an Elko part, drove the car for an hour, but couldn't get it to happen again. Brings it back the next day with the same concern, couldn't duplicate it a second time. Couldn't make it happen. 
So what should they do about that? This is a sometimes thing. Sometimes it does idles really high. Try checking the Well, it's got a vacuum leak. It's going to come and go all by itself. What's up with that? Are you big gases from it? Yeah, I guess you could probably build a scenario like that in your mind. Replaced and flashed the PCM. Problem fixed. Now I'm going to put a little addendum on there. How this conclusion was reached wasn't discussed, but they pretty much eliminated everything else, right? Uh, let's say, unless a smoking gun situation is present, the PCM should never be replaced before everything else has been eliminated. You know, too many times people didn't like the black box, they would throw a black box at it just because that was easy to do. Now, if you're paying, you know, six, eight hundred, a thousand dollars for the black box, and you throw it on there and that don't fix it, you're going to feel bad because the, typically the parts room won't take it back or the parts department won't. And you're, you know, somebody's got to pay for it. And, uh, you know, sometimes customers get charged for stuff like that. But anyway, 2004 Ford Ranger XLT. This is one you're going to have to figure out, okay? Intermittent dump frame. Sometimes when they turn the key, what does that sound like? That sounds like our Impala, doesn't it? Intermittent dump frame. They replace the neutral safety switch. <coughs> because crank comes through here, energize that relay, and they replace the starter relay. When the test slack connected to the tan red feed to the starter relay and crank, there's intermittently no power at the relay. Now you might notice, uh, you know, this right here, they're not seeing anything here sometimes. Right? So they're sometimes they're, they're, not, they're actually not seeing anything right there. Now, you remember it's coming from the ignition switch to the starter relay. All right. Now, look at this, though. There's a fuse that's coming from a smart junction box. Uh, and so, this is hot in start. Goes through that fuse. Goes down here. They've already replaced this. They've already replaced that. And they notice that whenever it doesn't start, they've got nothing here. What do you think? Well, this is intermittent. They haven't changed the fuse in it. You got a short. What's a short? Define short. short See, they got a wire that's... If there's a wire that's broken, that's an open. If it's a wire that's touching ground or another wire, that's a short. So a lot of times people just throw a blanket term. It's got a short in it. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So make sure that when you use that term, if you're talking mechanic, don't say it's got a short in it. Unless you're actually torching about the wire touching something. If the wire's in two, that ain't a short. That's an open. Two different terms. Opposite sides. Possible of open or it's touching somewhere. Some insulation missing. Justin, what do you think? It always that the fuse is always hot like it should be. He didn't check that. He just noticed, and you know, you've got to feel like if he ain't got it here, it's either going to be in one of these connectors with an intermittent connection. I'm starting to think maybe we need to check that. If that fuse's not hot, I'm going to think maybe we got a smart junction box problem. Because there's a lot, of, a lot of electronics in there, you know what I mean? And different connections and all. Uh, he didn't, and I don't know what he wound up finding, but I'm going to think, I'm thinking in this direction, I'm going to get right there when it won't start and see if i got power at that fuse. If I don't, but I want to know what, where is the power coming in. If the power is coming in but it ain't going out, it's got to be in that smart junction box. That's fairly common. See, so there's your smart junction box, your SJB. See that? And going through this, and it you know, continues right here. So, but you do have a connector here, a connector here. Now that right there uh, is basically giving you a connector number, and it tells you the pin number that that pin is in. That's pretty cool, isn't it? That's a connector, pin 38 in that connector. You know, you got a lot of pins in that connector. There's your circuit number. All right, this is pin five in connector C. So this connector goes through. This wire goes through the same connector twice. All right. You know, for whatever reason you might want to think. Uh, it's a 20 gauge pink wire. And then down here you got in C110, your pin 24. See how it's giving you the exact location of that pin that's in the connector? So you can tell if you're tracking it where it's going through there. But I'm, like I say, I'd get right up here and I'd say, if I'm turning it to start, if I can find out where that thing's going in and it ain't coming out, I don't think we got a problem here. But I'm not going to just throw one at it. You know what I'm saying? I want to troubleshoot it. We caught that smoking gun on the impound. We caught it. Caught in the edge. Yeah. Uh, once every few days, this envoy would crank, would crank and not start. Every time it throws a P1682 ignition one and switch circuit two and 160689, PCM power relay sent circuit low. Does that sound like our impeller? 
Think about it. It's not a way. Customer did state it acted up after the remote start was used. Uh, so we replaced the ignition switch just to the high failure rate. What happened on the valve? The ignition switch had already been replaced, right? Uh, the Viper alarm remote start, because that was an aftermarket thing, and it still wouldn't start. So he's a suspect, he's losing power from his main ECM relay. Yet to get the car to act up again. When he finally caught it here, he found out he's losing the control signal from the ECM to energize the relay. How does that sound? Right? So this control signal here, he's able to apply ground to the relay to make the engine run so he knows for sure. The wire from the box to the ECM has got good continuity, so on and so forth. Uh, and so he run perfect. He had continuity through the fuse box then, but he wound up replacing the fuse box, which is what we had to do. Okay, so think about it. Don't throw a fuse box at it first, but start thinking in that direction if you run into something like that. And uh, 2006 Nissan Titan XE, the blower motor problem, would stop working on higher fan speeds. So he had lower fan speed, but when he went up to his higher fan speed, he had nothing. He replaced the variable blower control, but no cigar. Got constant power at the blower motor, more control, white blue wire. Had the blue white wire, had battery voltage, so on and so forth. I mean, you can, start, you can read that until your eyes cross. But basically, this is a schematic, is what he's looking at. And so he was actually measuring these voltages where they were supposed to be. And he wound up determining that this basically had to be the problem because he was actually noticing that on his ABC signal it was changing voltages, but this wasn't responding like it should to run the motors. He was basically supposed to, when the blower motor relay is energized, it's supposed to change the speed of that if you tell it to change. And so the green wire, red wire at pin 2 would go up to 4.8 volts on high speed, and when the blower shuts off, it dropped to 3.76. The ground black white's got no voltage drop. And what he did is he tried two brand new aftermarket variable war controllers that were faulty. Got one from the dealer that fixed it. He got two aftermarket, and I didn't put the brand name up here, aftermarket war controllers that he was busting his fanny trying to troubleshoot this thing, and it turned out he had two bad controllers in a row from the same supplier. Probably came from the same batch. 2007 NG Wrangler, rough idle stall. He bought it with an engine knock, did a complete engine overhaul. And it had a literally slight stumble and accelerate, and after five minutes, the red lightning bolt starts flashing and the traction control light comes on. That's got to do with your throttle, you know, your electronic throttle control. Uh, this, once this occurs, the stumble gets worse, and if I don't hold the throttle pedal a bit, it'll stall. So he's got to keep his foot on the gas and keep stalling. 07 Wrangler 38. After it stalled, if he cycled the key off and back on, it would take another five minutes for it to happen. Uh, so we reset the TPS connection, check the TPS, shows its command of the computer to move. It was not doing that prior to the engine rebuild. This is the kind of stuff you can run into. Checked out the EGR and noticed the tube to the EGR was loose. He misspelled that. See that right there? That tube coming out of the top of the intake, it goes down there. Actually, it comes up there too from the EGR up to this, and it's feeding the EGR into the intake right there. And so the gasket was degraded. He think it would prevent the tube from being tightened. Put a new thick EGR gasket on it, torqued it down, and took care of his big massive leak that he had. All right. All right. Now then.